We hear now armchair astronomy with members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff talking to WBAI's David W. Teske. This is the 51st in our continuing series of programs on astronomy. Contributing their time and knowledge to this venture are members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff. They come hoping to give us laymen a fuller understanding of our universe. On today's program, the topic of the discussion is the Christmas star. With us is astronomer Dr. Kenneth L. Franklin and astronomer Dr. Fred C. Hess of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium. Welcome both of you, and Dr. Hess, will you begin? Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. These are the words taken from the gospel according to St. Matthew the only recorded words that we have which describes the star of Bethlehem. Fred, what do you think they meant by star? Well, that word star, of course, has been bandied around by people down through the ages. And really, in terms of the public, the word star actually refers to any object that one might see in the sky. This is in the context of the era that you're talking about. That is about. correct. And so uh, the star of Bethlehem may have been a single point-like object that we call a star today, or it may have been some other astronomical event. We don't know, and therein lies the tale of the star of Bethlehem. Well, what sort of things can you consider in the sky that could be a star that would satisfy the criteria of this description? Well, certainly any of the stars that we see uh, but uh, a planet, uh, as distinguished from a star, or possibly a, a comet, such as a Kaiseki that caused all of the excitement earlier this year. In other words, a number of different things could be considered, and astronomers in the past have been very much interested in seeing what kind of detectives they were, in seeing whether they could trace back and find out for themselves what the wise men might have seen. This is a very exciting thing. Now, of course, in connection with this star, there have been uh, many legends. It's a beautiful thought, you see, that there should be something in the sky, a sign in the sky. This is very appealing. Many legends, many stories have developed out of the folklore of people down through the ages throughout the Christian era. And we use the star today, as well you know. We use it uh, as decorations for Christmas time, which is upon us. We use it uh, on the packaging. We use it at the tops of our trees. We use it on the cards that we send each other at this time of year. We use it uh, as lights in our windows that we decorate so gaily. So the star very definitely is a, is a symbol of the time in which we find ourselves at this moment, used today in the 20th century. And of course our sky right now is uh, the very kind of sky that would cause people to to think back to the star of Bethlehem. We have a Christmas star this season right in our sky, don't we? Very definitely. Anyone who's been looking into the southwestern sky just after the sun has set all through this month of December has certainly seen a brilliant object, an object that has been increasingly brilliant night after night, lagging behind the sun about two hours, visible low in the southwest after sunset. And that has been uh, an attention gatherer for, oh, from way back. Now this object is a planet. It is the planet Venus. But it shines so arrestingly that it makes one wonder.
Could this have been the sort of thing that the wise men might have seen? Well, now, Venus, of course, is, is a very interesting object. As a planet, it resembles the Earth, I suppose, in many of its characteristics. At least, it's in orbit about the Sun, just as we are. It's closer to the Sun than the Earth. And at this very time in history, it's swinging around the left side of the Sun. Its journey around the Sun is only 225 of our days long. So it's a, a faster moving object being closer to the Sun. And it's a beautiful thing to see if we have a little optical assistance right now. If you have a small telescope, two and a half, three inches in diameter, and if you look at Venus, you'll see that now it's a crescent-shaped object. For Venus phases in the sky just the way the Moon does, it's a waning crescent because night after night the crescent has been getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And not only that, the diameter of Venus as seen and reflected in the crescent has been getting greater and greater as this month of December has worn on. And that is because Venus is roaring toward us in a very real sense as it comes swinging around the sun, an object that will pass between us and the sun on the 26th of January, early next year. Well, now, we go around the sun in 365 days. Venus goes around in about 225 days. But we get into the same general configuration about every 18 or 19 months. And Venus is a prominent object in our evening sky just about every year and a half. Right. So in about every three years, uh, at the way the timing is working out now, we find Venus to be a beautiful Christmas star-like object. But it comes up so frequently. The star that they're talking about in uh, this uh, passage from St. Matthew is a rare object. Yes, as a matter of fact, that's precisely why we'd, ha we'd have to rule Venus out as a probable explanation for the star of Bethlehem. Well, you could certainly use it as a beautiful symbol right it now. It truly it's is. It's not it. It's magnificent. And I'm sure anyone who would look at it would agree with that. But there are other things, too. Harken back just a month, Comet Achaea Secchi, what an exciting thing that was. And I'm sure many people saw it after it had swung round the sun, its tremendous tail visible in the morning sky rising just before the sun for a few weeks, as a matter of fact. Well, now, uh, maybe they saw a comet, huh? you see? <laughs> yes, but they've seen other comets, too. But there was something unusual about Comet Achaea Secchi that um, in good, clear atmosphere, which I'm afraid we didn't have in October around the New York area, but in a good, clear atmosphere like the desert region out around Flagstaff and the southern, uh, southwestern United States, they were able to see Comet Achaea Secchi in the daytime. Now, in the region of uh, Israel here, they generally have some pretty good weather like that in the desert regions. It's conceivable, perhaps, that there was a comet that could be seen in the daytime at that time. And that, of course, is a most unusual occurrence. Uh, we have uh, one or two of those a century, perhaps. Certainly no more often than that, huh? There was one in 1910. Uh, there have been others in the 1800s, the late 1800s, uh, in the general family. Yes, I think 1842 and uh, yes. 1865, I believe, one of those years yes. in the 1860s, somewhere 1882 around there. was... Or maybe uh, that's the one I'm thinking. Another one of the comet uh, Kayaseki group, right, the sun right. grazing group. And incidentally, the one in 1910 that I'm talking about that was visible in the daytime was not Halley's Comet. No, no, no. no. And we can rule out Halley's Comet, too. But there could have been a comet visible in the daytime. Well, now, that's an interesting possibility, you see. But just as in the case with Venus, as we reflect upon it, we have to uh, say, well, perhaps that is not the story. Symbolically, from the legends of men, comets have been associated with uh, less desirable things than the birth of a king, certainly. Comets associated in the minds of people with evil, pestilence, famine, revolution. Well, this is certainly not the kind of symbolism that one would associate with the journey of the Magi. And although comets are rarely seen by us now in the 20th century, the wise men, and they were wise men, familiar with the lore of the sky, they certainly knew of comets, those that were perhaps regular in their reappearance, and those that appeared but once, but they knew of them most assuredly. And uh, one would have to say that they're perhaps too common, too ordinary, to have caused these wise men to have taken a journey across the desert to the land of Judea. No, I'm afraid we have to rule the comet out, too. 
Well, now there's another type of event. In fact, just a short time ago, we had a shower of objects coming at us, a shower of meteors, the so-called Geminid meteor shower, earlier in the month of December. And this is one of the spectacular meteor showers that occurs every year, as a matter of fact, in the latter half of the month of December. Perhaps a, a very spectacular meteor display might have been the star of wonder, the sign in the sky. Well, now, they're rather common, of course, aren't they? They are rather common, and you can see them readily in the good, dark, clear sky of that uh, geographical location. However, once in a while, uh, an individual meteor is especially brilliant. A larger piece of this matter from space comes crashing into the atmosphere and heats up as it's burning to such an extent, though, that it, it explodes and uh, a sound follows in the wake frequently of this explosion. Well, that's called a bolide or a fireball. Do you think it might have been something like that? It doesn't last long enough. Yes. Yes, of course. Can you imagine chasing something like that on a camel across the desert? That's a wild ride. A wild ride, indeed. No, just not persistent enough. That's right. This hung in the sky, as it states in the passage. Yes, it went before them. It went before them. Hmm. And they knew of it. They saw it. Well, I'm afraid that meteors and bolides are also going to have to be eliminated from our Consideration is a possible explanation for the star of Bethlehem. Well, the search is really narrowing down. Certainly, we really would not consider, I'm quite sure, any of the very beautiful stars that are seen in the nights of Christmas time. Now, as we begin winter, we have the most beautiful, the brightest of all the stars that we see above Earth. But these stars are here every year at this time. They're called the fixed stars, and have been called that, because to our eyes, anyway, they, they simply do not move. They do not change their position relative to each other. They form the same patterns in the sky year after year after year. We know, of course, from modern astronomy that every star is in motion, exceedingly rapid motion, but the stars are so very, very far away that our eyes cannot detect, in our lifetime anyway, any of the true motion that these far distant suns actually possess. Well, the fixed stars of the sky, they would not be uh, the star of wonder, for the wise men would have known them, certainly. Once in a while, there is a new star that appears. A we new call star. it a nova, right. Ah, uh, yes. Tell us more about this. Well, in the year 1054, for instance, there was a uh, spectacular event that was recorded by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. This was an object that was so bright that it could be seen for several weeks, even during the daytime. A as star. A star. Mm -hmm. And then for months and months later, it was still visible in the sky. It occurred somewhere in the constellation of Taurus, the bull. Uh, we have uh, been able to find this location in the sky, and we find there today a cloud. A cloud that is over 40 light years in diameter now and is expanding at the rate of 800 miles a second. In other words, that was an explosion that occurred and it is still exploding. It is still separating. Mm -hmm. This cloud we call the Crab Nebula and that was a supernova in 1054. Well now to those who lived before telescopes were on the scene, finding a sudden appearing star like this, this must have been very exciting, obviously. And uh, the fact that we cannot apparently predict the occurrence of such a new star suddenly flaring up in the sky, this offers some extremely interesting possibilities, doesn't it? it certainly does. Could this have been the case? Well, there have certainly been others. In 1604, the great astronomer Johann Kepler saw exactly the same sort of thing. Another and Tycho, star. his uh, mentor, his, saw one right. a few years earlier than Exactly that. so. And so here were new stars. And Kepler, who was not what we'd call a modern astronomer, whose roots were still uh, very definitely into the mystical as well as into the scientific, became extremely interested in the possibilities presented by this nova as a possible explanation for the star of wonder. This is quite miraculous too, you see, because in those days they had the idea that nothing changed in the fixed stars, mm -hmm. that everything was fixed, immutable, and perfect as we saw it. 
and therefore this is always very startling to see something like this appear, a new star. Well, now this is perhaps the most uh, promising of all the leads that we've had until we read the words of the New Testament again. You'll recall from the passage that, that the court of Herod, the wise men of his court, did not see the star. Now, had there been anything so, so dramatically new, so completely different in the sky, this is something that all could have seen. The wise men from the, from the east could have come to Herod and pointed it out, but no, it was not visible when they were in the court of Herod. They did not see the star again until after they had left, according to the passage. So it was definitely not obvious at this time. Very definitely. So, could it have been a nova? No, I'm afraid it could not have been a nova. It had to be another sign that is not so, so directly visible as, and so simple to see as simply looking up, looking up with the eyes and finding it there in the sky. No, I think the nova is not the explanation either. In other words, as a matter of interpretation in what one sees in the sky. Exactly so. And that word see is a rather critical word in terms of the passage in the New Testament. Does it mean really see, to look at, or does it mean understand, or to appreciate that there is something to there? To know, yes, mm. yes. Well, we rule out the Nova, then, as a probability. Well, this really takes us down now to almost the very nub of things. And so we have to look now not for an object quite so much as for an event. Was there anything taking place in the skies when Christ was born? Oh, wait. Yes, wait a minute. When <laughs> was Christ born? Now, this is the year 1965, A.D., Anno Domini. But our process, our procedure of dating and numbering the years from the birth of Christ, this did not happen in the year Christ was born or anywhere near that time. In fact, the idea was originated in the seventh century by a, a monk of the Middle Ages. Was it really that late, the seventh Dion, century? Dionysius, 680, I think, was the year, somewhere along in there. But anyway, it was in that time. Dionysius Exiguus. Dionysius, or Dennis, it would be in English, Dennis the Small. Well, now, Dennis was a very pious monk, and he thought that the numbering of the years uh, in the Christian era might well uh, be revised, and that we should start with the birth of Christ. Well, now, of course, at that time, in the numbering system, they started with one. And I suppose everybody says, well, what else? But you see, there, there is a very important number, zero. And at the time that Dennis was alive, the numbering system in the Western world did not have a zero. This was almost in the realm of Einstein at that time to be able to understand the concept of nothing as a number. That's right. That's right. It, well, it was way ahead of his time, as a matter of fact, because it wasn't for another century that they actually started to use zero. Well. Anyway, Dionysius, using historical records that uh, would have been available to him in his monastery, worked back through generations of time until he came out with his answer. Well, now uh, we know that this uh, work that he did was not precisely accurate. We know this from other records that have been uncovered in the time that has intervened since the numbering of the years has been on the A.D. system. We know, for example, that the Joseph and Mary, the parents, made this journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem as a result of a very definite order by the Roman emperor for a, a taxation. And each had to go to the city of his family to be enrolled for this taxation. Now, when was this order issued? Well, there was an order issued in the year that we would call by our calendar 11 A.D. But that one was accompanied by great riots in the land of Judea. And there have been historians who have pointed out specifically that the enrollment that was involved was not the one of 11 A.D. And then about 100 years ago near Ankara in Turkey, tablets were uncovered with inscriptions on them that gave dates of other 
decrees for taxation issued from Rome. And uh, lo and behold, the date 8 BC comes up on one. And so we say, well, the nativity had to have occurred after the year 8 BC. So this is one clue. Ah, but then Herod was alive at the time of the nativity. Which Herod, Fred? There were two of them. Yes, but this was the, this was the first of the two Herods. This is not the Herod who was alive during the manhood of Jesus. This is the Herod who was alive at the time of the childhood of Jesus. Now, there was a great historian by the name of Josephus, a historian of the Jewish people, and he recorded circumstances surrounding the death of this first Herod. In his records, he points out that there was an eclipse of the moon at the time that Herod died. Well, now, an eclipse of the moon is something that an astronomer can date, can trace out. Right. And when we look for an eclipse of the moon that occurred visible in this part of the world, we find that the only possible time is the year which we would call, according to our calendar, 4 BC. Well, now this really narrows the time down, but strangely, it does not narrow it near zero or one. You see, 8 BC from the tablets uncovered in Ankara, 4 BC from the timing of the death of Herod, according to our present calendar. And so we've narrowed it between those two. We have no other records that can can bring us closer to a specific year. But we have another clue, again, from the words of the New Testament. Because when Christ was born, shepherds were in the fields tending their flocks. Well, now, this is the land of Judea. And it is true that we celebrate Christmas now in December. But was the first Christmas in December? Well, we know from the customs of the land that December is not the season when shepherds take their flocks to the fields. December is the coldest and rainiest of the months in this part of the world. And so it's in the spring, after the rainy season, that shepherds take their flocks out. In the spring, when the new lambs are to be brought forth. And since the shepherds were in the fields, we are led to the idea that the nativity occurred not in the dead of December winter but rather in the late winter or early spring. Now let's see if we can do a little better than that. The decree was issued from Rome, 8 BC. It had to be taken by courier across the extent of the Roman Empire, which just barely reached to the land of Judea. Remember, this was 2,000 years ago. This was not the time of modern communication. Couriers perhaps going by horseback or by ship across the Mediterranean to the land of Judea. The decree comes. The local officials, then faced with the problem of setting up the mechanics of taking this nationwide census, and the word going to all the outlying farms and all the villages, pack, get ready for the trip. You're going to have to go to your native city in order to be enrolled. Well, now, this is going to take time. This cannot be done in a matter of weeks or even months. This is something that would take a year or maybe even two years in order factually to be accomplished. And so, if the decree is issued in 8 BC, then perhaps we look to 7 or even to 6 BC for an event that might have happened in the sky. And now we look to our astronomical tables. Look to those books that describe in numerical form events that could have happened. Well, now, what changes most dramatically of all in the sky? Why, it's the positions of the planets, of course. And we search back, not for one, not for two, but for a group of planets, and see what might have been happening. Well, as you know, the planets wander. They sometimes gather together in one part of the sky, and at other times they spread out and are scattered across the, the entire zodiac of the heavens. Well, lo and behold, when we look back in time, to the year that, according to our calendar, is 6 BC, we find three planets very closely packed together in the sky. The planets Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, the three most distant planets from the sun that our unaided eyes can see. Well, now, they were gathered together in a small triangle in one part of the sky. But in the same days, 
another event was also taking place. The two most distant, Jupiter and Saturn, were undergoing a very special sort of maneuver in the sky. The basic motion of the planets is from right to left as we look into the southern sky. Against the background of the stars. That's right. However, each year, as a result of the Earth's own motion around the sun, these distant planets seem to stop and then turn around and go back for a little while, moving in what is called retrograde motion, then stop and resume their direct forward motion across the sky. Well, now it happened that both Jupiter and Saturn were in the same part of the sky. Jupiter passed Saturn. In other words, had one conjunction, meaning they were in the same direction. It passed Saturn. Then it started its retrograde motion and came back towards Saturn, passed it again, had a second conjunction, then stopped, resumed its direct motion, and went on by Saturn a third time. And so within a span of just a couple of months, there were three conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. Now, this is a very unusual sort of event. As a matter of fact, I looked it up. I took the trouble to find out how frequently this occurs. And from the year 2500 BC until now, this sort of triple conjunction has happened exactly 32 times, and it happened in 6 BC. Happened indeed just as Mars was coming along to form a tight little triangle. Now this is very rare because Mars joining these other two as they were going through this little maneuver has happened only 18 times in four centuries of time. So this indeed is a rare sort of event. It happened in 6 B.C. It had not happened before that. Uh, the last time was in 403 B.C. So no one alive had ever seen anything like that take place. This is for certain. And then where did this all take place? Well, it, it took place in that part of the sky that has the constellation called Pisces the Fishes directly behind the planets. So the planets from Earth appear to be amongst the stars of that particular constellation. Now, the Magi were followers of Zoroastrianism, a sort of astrological type of religion. And the constellations of the zodiac were very important to them. In fact, each of the constellations was dedicated toward one of the important nations on Earth at the time. And Pisces was the house of the Hebrews, the home of the Jews. And what did they see? They saw these three, Saturn and Jupiter and Mars, coming together in the house of the Hebrews. And at the same time, within a few months, the fast-moving objects in the solar system, the sun, the moon, Mercury, and Venus, also had gone through exactly the same part of the sky in a span of less than three months. All of their seven celestial gods, in a sense, paying a call on the land, on the household of the Jews. But Herod and his company didn't see this. They did not believe in astrology. They didn't watch the motions of the planets. They cared nothing about it, and there was no attempt to understand this. And so this sign, this very unusual gathering of the planets, this is what may have been the sign of wonder, the star of Bethlehem, that excites it so much even now in this day and age. At least, this is as close as we can come. And if you want to see this visually presented, come to the planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, to see this now through the very beginning of next year. And practically every December. Yes. Thank you both very much. We have been listening to astronomer Dr. Kenneth L. Franklin and astronomer Dr. Fred C. Hess of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium speaking about the Christmas star. We hope you will be with us next week, and if you have any questions or topics you'd like discussed on future programs, indicate them by card or letter to Armchair Astronomy, WBAI, 30 East 39th Street, New York, 16 New York. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in future programs. Until next week, good day. This has been Armchair Astronomy with members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff talking to WBAI's David W. Teske.